All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for showing up tonight to 2020 and your money with Governor Mike Huckabee. Hope you're excited for this evening. We, we certainly are. We've been preparing for this evening for a long time. Right, Natalie? Uh, and by the way, I just want to recognize Natalie and everybody give Natalie a hand for doing such a great job of, of getting everything ready for this evening. So uh, I'm David Lee. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Mach 1 Financial Group. You might have seen our building. We're located on North Walton across from the Walmart Logistics Center. Been in business for uh, 14 years now. Uh, many of you in the room are clients. Many of you are not. Um, but um, we primarily specialize in doing retirement planning. You can read more about us in the, uh, in the program here. Uh, as far as an overview of the evening, first of all, administratively, restrooms. Um, the women's restrooms are out the doors this direction. Men's restrooms are over here on this end of the auditorium. So uh, make sure we all know where the restrooms are. Uh, speaking of that, there will be a restroom break after Governor Huckabee speaks. He'll speak for maybe 45 minutes or so. Then we'll have a brief uh, intermission and a restroom break. Uh, it'll be 15 minutes. We. Uh, I was a military pilot by background, so I believe in kind of precision, you know, starting exactly on time. So we will have a, a brief intermission and we will start exactly on time. We will give you a five minute warning, a two minute warning, a one minute warning. The lights will flash and we will start exactly on time after the restroom break. Now that's important. The reason why that's important is because tonight is mainly about FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes and raising money for FCA and raising awareness about uh, who FCA is and what do they do and their mission. So immediately after the restroom break, um, Coach Barry Lunny is going to be up here and he's going to talk a little bit about their mission and FCA. So we don't want anybody to miss that uh, talk by, Governor, uh, by uh, Coach Lunny. Uh, also, I want to mention administratively, we're going to have a period of questions and answers at the um, – during the panel discussion. So after Coach Lunny talks about FCA, we're gonna have about a 45 minute Q&A session. And we're gonna have uh, this number here that you can see. You might wanna take your pen and paper and write that down. But um, we want you to think of questions during the talk and uh, prepare to text. The, you can text those questions in even as the governor is speaking or any time during the evening. And we will uh, try to answer as many of those questions as possible during the Q&A time um, in, in the second half of the program. So there's the, there's the number. Uh, you simply type that number in and type and text your question in. Um, also, you should know there's going to be uh, three nice door prizes. We'll talk more about the door prizes later, but there's going to be three door prizes. You must be present to win, and we will do a drawing at the very end of the Q&A session, and that will be at about 5 till 9 with the goal to be out of here by 9 p.m. Um, so, the, uh, what you got to turn in to be in that drawing is this response sheet here in your program. You'll notice there's a per perforated tear out. This is how we're, we're going to collect these at the end of the evening. Um, and this is how you can indicate if you're interested in helping FCA out or if you're interested in, in learning more about what we do at Mach 1 Financial. So, if you can kind of go ahead and get a head start on filling those out. We would sure appreciate that. That'll make it more efficient at the end of the evening. Okay, um, I think I got through all of my administrative housekeeping uh, issues. So I want to introduce Governor Huckabee. I know that's what everybody's here for tonight. Uh, most, of, most of you already, we feel like we know the governor because we see him on TV and, of course, him being the, the, uh, the governor of the state. He was the 44th governor of Arkansas. Uh, host of the Huckabee Show on Trinity Broadcasting Network, a Fox News contributor, and a 12-time New York best-selling author. So, without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce Governor Huckabee. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you very much, David. Thank all of you for coming. What a joy to be here. Um, I'm just delighted with the introduction I got tonight. You know why? Because these days, I don't get that kind of introduction. Telling about me, here's what I mostly get. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sarah's dad. <laughs> Which is great, I love it. 
no parent is ever jealous of his or her child's success, and uh, I'm delighted about Sarah. She actually has two older brothers. Uh, they do not have the notoriety that she does, and boy, do they like it too. Uh, it's, it's funny because people ask me all the time, boy, I love your daughter, which is great because I do too. Um, I'm not objective about her. I don't pretend that I am. Uh, but when they'll say things like, where'd she get so tough? I say, have you ever met her mother? <laughs> not that I say that when Janet is around, but honestly, a lot of the toughness came from having two older brothers. Sarah's the only girl youngest of our three children, and when she was a little tyke, her brothers were ruthlessly mean to her, and I mean bad, once they super glued her fingers together. That was a trip to the emergency room. You know, you just don't pull them apart with super glue. It, that's an ER trip. And then one time they fed her a big glass of mud and told her it was a chocolate milkshake. Yeah, your reaction is a little milder than Janet's and mine was when it all happened. But I'll tell you what that did, toughen the kid up. So wasn't too many experiences like that. And she got to where she knew that if she was going to survive, she had to fight back. And boy, did she ever learn the craft. So she's pretty good at it. When she was at the White House, people would ask me, did it make me nervous when she would walk into that press room, all those vultures sitting out there in front of her? I said, boy, it really did but not for her. <laughs> I was nervous for some of those goons sitting in front of her, like Jim Acosta from CNN. I thought, this, this guy doesn't know what he's dealing with here. I, I'll, I'll tell you this, it, um, it sometimes would happen that they would ask some ridiculous question, and I could see in her eyes, in her face, and, and I knew what she was thinking. Now, most of you here, if you're not native-born Southerners, you've been here long enough to get this. I, I speak sometimes in places like Illinois or Syracuse, New York, and they totally don't get it, so I have to explain it to them. But when a Southern woman begins or ends a sentence with these three words, whether it's explicitly stated or just implied, it does not mean what you think it means. Those three words, bless your heart. You see, people up north think, oh, well, how sweet. They're, they're, they're being... No. <laughs> when a southern woman starts or ends a sentence with, bless your heart, you're about to be gutted like a deer. <laughs> you just don't realize it until it's too late to stop. Some of you men probably grew up in the north. You married a southern woman, and it took you a few years to figure this out, didn't it? Am I right? Yeah. Well, tonight, what an honor to be here with David Lee and the people from Mach 1. I think it's pretty cool that a guy who was a fighter pilot and flew F-16s names his company Mach 1. How original is that, huh? <laughs> the speed of sound. Now, maybe more than many of you, I'm going to tell you, I have an unbelievable level of awe and appreciation for what David Lee did as an F-16 pilot. When I was governor, that made me commander-in-chief of the National Guard. We had both the C-130 wing and we had the F-16 wing. And then, of course, we had the Army Guard. Great, great experience being able to lead these organizations. But the F-16 wing, I was invited to fly in an F-16. I'm going to tell you, people have asked me, what was that like? Was it like one of the really cool rides at Disney? I'm going to tell you something, Disney would love to have something like that. They've never created anything quite like it. It was the most unbelievable experience of my life. The only thing that really was unnerving was the uh, five hours of preparation that I had to go through, because they don't let you just get in a jet and fly around with a pilot. Uh, they go through all these things that could happen, and by the time they tell you all the bad things that could happen while you're flying in an F-16, it's like, maybe I don't want to do this. I mean, they have a knife in my flight suit in case I, you know, have to parachute, get caught in a tree, have to cut myself out. I'm thinking, no, dude, I'm waiting until somebody comes and gets me. <laughs> I ain't falling down out of a tree. And they told me what to do in case the pilot who was in front and I'm in the back in the old models that had two seats, most of them don't anymore. What happens if the pilot 
is injured and blacks out. And I have to hit the eject button and eject him and then eject myself. And I'm thinking, I hope I remember to get him out because, by gosh, I'm getting out of this thing. <laughs> but then they tell me that if, if you hit it and the uh, automatic ejection doesn't work and the canopy doesn't blow, you have to do it manually, and you take your right hand, you reach over on your left side for the manual canopy blow. And then the ejection seat will thrust you out of the plane. And they say you will black out because you're going to be flying out of that plane so fast. And when you wake up as you're descending down in your parachute, you'll have a broken right arm because you won't have time to move it back over before it hits on the dash as you come out of the airplane. Just wanted you to know why you have a broken right arm as you're flying up there. I almost said, I don't think I want to do this. But I did, and I'm telling you, it was the greatest ride of my life. But I came out of that thing with a couple of memories. One, I did not get sick, which was in and of itself a big deal. Because every camera in Arkansas was waiting for me <laughs> as I taxied back into that plane. Now, I had told the pilot, who was the commander of the wing, J.R. Dallas, that was actually his name, which was in and of itself wonderful. <laughs> and uh, he was full bird colonel, head of the wing. Keith, you probably knew J.R. from Fort Smith area because that's uh, where the wing was based. And before we went up, I said, now, Colonel, I'm going to tell you something. I know when guys like you get a guy like me in one of these things, your goal is to show how tough you are and how weak I am. Get up there and do some funny stuff so I'll hurl my cookies all over the cabin and, and that way you can talk about how I just didn't have what it takes. I said, I get that. I just want to remind you of one thing. Your future is in my hands. <laughs> up in that airplane, I am totally in your hands. But when we land and we're back on the ground, your future belongs to me. <laughs> we had a magnificent ride. But he told me everything we were going to do, whether it was a barrel roll or flying upside down, all the cool stuff I got to do. And I think because he talked me through it, I was fine. And we got back on the ground. I thanked him. A couple of months later, I was back up in Fort Smith. And I told the story in front of the entire wing. They were all assembled out there in front of the hangar. And I said, uh, you know, JR is a pretty smart guy. He knew that he better not take me up there and do something stupid. And he didn't. And I said, and I want to thank you for that, General. Come and get your star. I pinned a star on him. <laughs> now, it wasn't just for the ride. I mean, he had earned this star. But boy, was that ever a nice way to present it to him. And I told him later, if I'd gotten up there and you'd monkeyed me around, I'm telling you right now, that star would still be in a box somewhere, not on your shoulder. Well, David Lee uh, flew F-16s which is more impressive to me than maybe to most of you, because here's what I learned just from that brief time. These guys were multitasking when nobody even heard the term. They got to fly the airplane at mock speed, which in and of itself is a full concentration job. They got to run the navigation system, the weapon system. They've got to look at weather, and they have to fly in formation just a few feet away from another plane. All that combined at the speed of sound. And it is absolutely an amazing thing to be able to do. And so uh, when David got out of the Air Force and out of the Air Guard, he created an organization appropriately named Mach 1. And it's all about helping people make some plans for their own financial future. I'm no financial expert. Uh, I wouldn't pretend to be. I don't even play one on television. I do something different. But I know this, I know that I, like most Americans, because I'm not an expert, uh, I need help. I need to talk to people who do this every single day. I need to talk to people who watch things that I wouldn't even know to watch. And I've got to have people I trust. I've got to have people that I believe are looking after my best interest. Because if I've worked hard and made the money and put it aside for my retirement or for things I want to do for my grandchildren, or for my alma mater, or whatever I want to do it for, then I want somebody managing it that is heads up the whole time. 
And that's why it's a real delight and privilege for me to be here because I know that David has built a company based on Christian principles and Christian values. Uh, I respect that. I, I believe that that's important because it's based on a simple notion that believers follow, and that is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Honestly, that would solve pretty much every problem we have in our entire world, if you think about it. What wouldn't be fixed if every single person lived by the rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you? Realize we'd never have any more crime, because nobody would ever want to be robbed. Nobody would ever want to be murdered. So if you didn't want to be robbed or murdered, you'd never rob or murder anybody. If you didn't ever want someone to break in your house and steal your stuff, you'd never break into somebody else's house and steal their stuff. I mean, if you think about it, every single problem that we have in our culture and society would be eradicated if we lived by the simple teaching of Jesus to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. And if you're trusting the assets and the resources that you've worked hard for, you need somebody who lives by that rule of treating you like they would wish to be treated if you were managing their resources and assets. Tonight, I'm not here to be political, so I want to be very clear about that. Um, I get to talk politics a lot on the Fox News Channel and even on my show on TBN, which is, by the way, the most fun I've ever had in my life. I taped that show up in Nashville, uh, so you can imagine we certainly have music being in Nashville. And I get to play with a lot of the guest artists. I had the Beach Boys on a couple of weeks ago. Do you know how cool it is to play bass guitar with the Beach Boys? Does anybody, can you relate to that at all? So when I get to do the stuff like that, I play with the Oak Ridge Boys, or I play with Toby Keith and Willie Nelson and all these artists that, you know, I never thought I would meet, much less play on stage with. Sometimes people say, man, I saw you playing with it was George Jones when he was still alive or all these people. And I didn't know you were that good. My response is, I'm not that good, but it's my show. I get to play. <laughs> they can cover for me. But what a thrill it is. I, the reason I'm telling you this is because, uh, you know, I have run for office. And believe it or not, that's really hard work. I know a lot of people think it isn't, but it is. It's hard work to run for office. You put a lot on the line. You take a lot of risk. Then I was fortunate enough to be elected several times. Lieutenant governor, governor, uh, love the job, but the hardest job I've ever had. It's hard work. Believe it or not, it really is. And it's a 24-7 kind of concentration. But I loved every minute of it. And now, for Fox News and for TBN, and for a newsletter that I edit and a whole lot of other forums, I don't run for office and I don't uh, hold office, but I talk about the people who run for office and who hold office. It's the easiest job I've ever had in my life. <laughs> and it pays me way better than ever running for office or holding office ever did. I just wish I'd have been this smart a long time ago. You want people doing things who kind of have some understanding of what they're doing. I don't listen to a lot of commentators if they've never been on the field. To me, that's important. Tonight, there's going to be a great opportunity for people to help Fellowship of Christian Athletes, FCA, a phenomenal organization that has shaped, molded, and transformed the lives of many young men and women throughout this country. And probably some of you here in this room, uh, your life was dramatically influenced by FCA. I myself was never a great athlete. I tried, like every kid growing up in Hope, Arkansas. Charles Ratliff is down here on the front row. Can't believe Charles is on the front row. I always pegged you the back row guy, Charles, but here you are. Man. <laughs> and Charles knew that in Hope, Little League Baseball was the world. That was everything. And like every other kid, I played Little League Baseball until one night at the age of 11, I broke this finger. I was catching, I misjudged a foul tip, I did something catchers aren't supposed to do, and that's catch it with my mitt and my bare hand extended from the mitt. You're supposed to do it like that, let the mitt do the job. But I wanted to catch it. And I did, in a way, my finger caught it, it hit that finger and just peeled it right back, pointing back toward my elbow. 
I held up my mangled finger and I pointed to my coach and I said, hey coach, I think I broke my finger. <laughs> and I could have been an orthopedic surgeon with diagnosis skills like that. That ended my baseball career. Uh, to this day, I can only bend that finger like that. But it's okay. I mean, I had really decided that I was, I was never going to quarterback the Dallas Cowboys to a Super Bowl. These days, I'm not sure anybody else ever will either, but uh, <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to do it. I knew I was never going to pitch the Cardinals into a World Series. That wasn't going to happen. So I had to find something else to do and leave maybe the hard work of athleticism to other people. But I got into politics, and one thing I did understand was you learn a lot more when you play the game than just when you watch it. And I always felt like that the people who are sportscasters, but they've never played the game, aren't as valuable as the ones who can tell you what the guy's thinking. When he's back in the pocket, ready to pass, and he looks up, and there are three guys running full speed, and every one of them weigh 350 pounds or more. And there's some guy who's never played. He's up in the announcement. Let me tell you what the quarterback should have done. I want to know from a guy who was the quarterback to tell me what it was like to look up there and realize, you are about to be killed. <laughs> there's something important about entrusting important things to the people who've actually done them. And it's one of the reasons that uh, I think having folks like David Lee and his staff at Mach 1 help people through their finances, it makes a whole lot of sense because they do it every day. This is what they do. I don't know if you know this, but only 17% of Americans really get any professional help to manage their assets. And it doesn't matter if your assets are into the millions of dollars uh, or if they're thousands of dollars. It, it shocks me that 83% of Americans go it on their own. And only 17% say, maybe I should get a little help with this stuff. Because unless you do it for a living, unless it's what you're really good at and knowledgeable about, then it might be good to have someone give you some help. For the same reason that if you have a kidney stone, I highly recommend going to a urologist, not doing it on your own kitchen table and say, honey, I can save us about $1,500 or more if I do it myself. Get one of them knives over there from the, from the drawer. Nobody's that stupid. But sometimes the big important decisions of our life, we need to get people who can help us. Now, I want to speak more generally tonight. I'm no financial advisor. Uh, I got to go to them and ask for help. But I am an observer of our culture, and I'm an observer of the political realm. And as I said, I'm not going to be partisan, and I'm not going to endorse candidates here tonight, and I'm not going to uh, try to tell you how to vote or who to vote for or who to vote against. But let me tell you that there is a basic premise that we really need to be thinking about as a country. Because increasingly, we are coming to a crossroads of whether or not we're going to go in the direction that turns sharply to the left or that turns to the right. And, and without trying to say this is Democrat, Republican, liberal or conservative, it has really more to do not so much with the horizontal aspects of politics, left, right, liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican. That's all horizontal. The bigger issue is whether or not we're looking at things from a vertical perspective. I would highly encourage people, rather than to see everything on the horizontal spectrum, see it on the vertical spectrum and ask this question. If we do this thing, whatever this thing may be that's being proposed, will it get better or will it get worse? Will it take us up or will it take us down? And rather than focus so much on the left or the right, focus on the up and the down. And let me tell you that there are some things that are being put before you as a country, as a citizen, that you have to decide, will it make you better or will it make your life worse? Will it help your children and your grandchildren to have a better life or will it threaten the existence of their freedom? A couple of examples. 
The big battle today is whether or not we're going to be a nation that embraces socialism or capitalism. I mean, it's as simple as that. Socialism is the idea that everybody basically throws what they have into a great big pot, and it's evenly distributed, although it never is evenly distributed. It's distributed out, and it's always distributed not according to a particular need. It's distributed to whoever is distributing it, getting the most benefit from it. And that's the lie of socialism. It's, a, it's an economic system that's never worked, ever. By the way, it's only about 120 years old. In the great scheme of things, it's not that old of a system as an economic reality. But what's frightening is that when people embrace it, they clearly don't understand that historically it has never, ever worked. For a period of time, it may appear to, but it's so easy for it to be corrupted. And it basically disincentivizes the idea that people would work at all. For example, if you're in college, and looking around this room, none of you are. <coughs> but if you were, and you, once you probably were, if you were that kind of person that stayed up all night, you did an all-nighter, and you're out at Waffle House because it's the only thing open at 3 in the morning, and you're studying, and you're really just putting it all in there. And you cram for the test, you go and take it, and you make a 98. You're proud of it. You ought to be. You worked really, really hard to get it. Now, there were friends in your dorm, and they weren't at Waffle House. They weren't studying. They were partying hard. And they were having a great old time. They don't even remember what a good time they had. They were having such a great time, if you get the drift. And they showed up, no sleep, but not from study. And they bombed the test. I mean, flagged out, got a 43. Here's what socialism would say. Hey, kid that made a 98, you don't need that many points. This kid over here that made a 43, he needs some. We're going to take 30 of your points and bring you down to a 78. We're going to take his 43, we're going to make him a 73. You'll still be a little bit ahead of him, but that'll balance it all out, and you'll both make Cs. Nobody flunks. Nobody excels. Hey, Mr. 98, are you cool with that? And I'm going to tell you what he says. No. He probably will say it with a little more emphasis. There's nobody who wants to be played as a chump. And at that point, the guy's a chump because he's worked really hard. And for what? For nothing. There was no incentive for him to work that hard. It's the same if you're an athlete. Again, I'm not pretending that I ever was, but I could see the guys that went to the weight room and worked really hard to get muscled up and tough, and the guys that didn't. And the guys who did, they were all state, all district. They were good. They were starters. And the guys who didn't, they got splinters in their backslide riding the bench because they never started. They never got rewarded because they never got good enough to do something with excellence. The point is that in our culture today, the biggest battle we're facing is socialism versus capitalism. The idea that if you really work hard and you make good decisions, you'll be rewarded for that. By the way, I believe it's biblical. How many of you remember the story in the Bible Jesus told of the master who was going away on a journey and he had three servants and he called them together? And he said to the first one, I'm going to give you 10 talents. Talent was an amount of money. It was a specific sum. He said, I'm going to give you some money, and I've got to be away on a journey. While I'm gone, take this 10-talent sum of money. See what you can do with it. Another guy called him up, said, uh, I'm going to give you five talents, five sums of money. While I'm gone on the trip, see what you can do with it. And then there was a third one. He said, I'm going to give you one sum of money. And... Not as much as the others, but see what you can do with it. Master's gone. He comes back, calls the guy that had been given 10, said, how'd he go? He said, Master, you gave me 10. I doubled it. I got 20. I took what you gave me, and I worked real hard. I was a good manager, responsible with it, and I got 10 more. 
The master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little things. I'm going to make you manager over bigger things. The guy who had five was called before the master. How'd you do? He said, well, you gave me five. I took it, worked real hard, and I got five more. I doubled what you gave me. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with little things. I'm going to make you manager over bigger things. And then comes a guy that had only been given one sum of money. And the master said, so what would you do with yours? He said, you know, I, I knew you were a hard person to work for. Very difficult. So what I did, I took the one you gave me. I dug a hole, stuck it in there, buried it. When you came, I dug up the hole, and here you go. You gave me one thing, you get one thing back. Basically, I didn't lose it, but I didn't grow it. I'm just giving you back what you already had. And to him, the master said, you slothful and wicked servant, because you did nothing with what you had, I'm going to take what you have and give it to the person who had 10 and it turned it into 20. It's a simple parable. You've heard of it a gazillion times. But that's capitalism in its rawest form. It's that whatever it is that God has given you, he doesn't expect you to do the same with it as Michael Bloomberg has done with his. <laughs> by the way, global warming was caused by the money he burned over this last week. <laughs> just, just so you know. All right, that's as political as I'm going to get. I just I couldn't leave that one alone. No, God does not expect any of us to do what he's never called us, equipped us, or handed us a responsibility of doing. And if he's given us ten talents, he does expect us to do well with ten. But if he's only given us five, he's not expecting us to do what the guy with ten did. But if he gives us one, he expects us to do more than dig a hole, bury it, and leave it for no growth whatsoever. That's capitalism in its rawest, purest form, and it has been helping people who go from poverty to prosperity because they worked hard, and they took what they had, and they managed it well, and the rewards were great. And the difference between socialism and capitalism is that there is no reward in socialism. Had that story been told from a socialist perspective, the guy that had 10 turned it into 20? would have been told to give up most of his 20 and hand it to the guy who buried his. And the guy that had five and turned it into 10 would be told, cough it up, kiddo, because there's some people over here that slept while you were working, and we're going to give it to them. And I guarantee you, if that were the story, a lot of us would say about the Gospels, well, that just doesn't seem like something I want to buy in on. Of course not. And it's one of the big things that's going to happen in the course of our political environment that I want to mention. And it's whether we embrace the idea of collectivism or individualism. Whether or not we believe that when our founders created this magnificent country, it was created so that we would be looked at as individuals with personal responsibility, accountability, and capability, or whether we were going to be mere wards of the state and that we were only as good as we could be within our collective group, whatever the group was, whether it was our gender, our race, our ethnicity, our socioeconomic standing. And if you believe in statism, if you believe in collectivism, then you believe that you are stuck where you're started, and only if your group gets better can you get better. That's not America. America was built on the notion that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed not by their government, but by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this is what makes us unique as a country, and it's why that this fledgling little country that should never have even survived its earliest days has become the greatest power in the history of mankind because we were built on the notion that you are an individual and you don't have to wait till your group catches up. You can be what you choose to be and you will be held individually responsible and you will reap the rewards individually. Hopefully you will be generous with what you've reaped 
that you will want to give it to your church, to maybe a college that changed your life, to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes that shapes the lives of young people so that they are encountered with the claims of Christ in their lives and they're edified by spiritual uh, teaching in a place where sometimes they don't get it. And, and this is why I hope that tonight two things happen. One, you realize that if you need help with your financial decisions, that you get professional help from people who know what they're doing. And the second is that as a side benefit of us being here, that FCA gets a real boost in the arm, which means that a lot of young men and young women from your area are going to be confronted with the claims of Christ and will have their everlasting souls transformed. As I said to you, I'm not a great athlete, never was. When I was governor, I got to do some pretty cool stuff. F-16 flying was one of them. Another one that wasn't so cool happened when Mike Levitt, governor of Utah, invited me and a couple of other governors to go to Salt Lake City in February of 2001 for a conference that he was hosting. Get the date, February 2001, exactly one year to the month before the Winter Olympics of February 2002. So we do the conference, and on Friday night, he gets up afterwards, he says, now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special treat for you tomorrow. We're going to take you to Olympic Village. The public hasn't even been able to get there yet. Some of the athletes are there training. It's almost completed. You're going to get one of the first behind-the-scenes views of the Olympic Village, see the athletes train. We have a very special treat. We're going to have the governor's bobsled competition. <laughs> that woke me up. And I thought, well, I guess they're going to name bobsleds after us and we're going to cheer them on. But he kept talking and it sounded like we were going to be in the bobsleds, which I thought was the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Like Charles Ratliff, I grew up in Hope, Arkansas, folks. You never saw snow in Hope. Every other year we get a little dusting. And everything closed for like a week. <laughs> Wasn't even an inch of snow. And everybody went to the store to get milk and bread for reasons no one really to this day can figure out. Even if you didn't need milk and bread, you got the store, baby, you got to get some milk and bread. What, well, you think we're going to die? And I hear about these people up north, and they die shoveling snow, have a heart attack. And I thought, give it to the Yankees. They're out there shoveling snow. No wonder they get a heart attack. Why don't they just wait till it melts? It'll melt tomorrow. Until I got to Iowa and New Hampshire and plays. Really, that snow doesn't melt all winter long. Man, it doesn't melt till May. They don't shovel, they'll never see daylight. So I don't get this bobsled thing. But Levitt says, don't worry, we'll get you some training. <laughs> Lovely. Next day we go to Olympic Village. My training consists of pairing me with a 16-year-old junior Olympic athlete who's going to teach me how to drive the bobsled. We get to the bottom of the bobsled track. It's one mile of solid ice from the bottom to the top. He puts these spikes on my boots and he walks me from the bottom to the top, telling me in each of the 13 curves in the bobsled track where I need to put the skids as I'm steering the bobsled. Now, bobsleds can go 95 miles an hour. Levitt told us not to worry. We were amateurs. Ours probably wouldn't get past 75. <laughs> Very comforting. So we're going up the, the track, and the kid is saying, this is like curve 12. And, and like when we get here, you need to put the skids like right here. Because if you like put them up here, we could like go off. <laughs> and that's not good. <laughs> and, and if you get the skids like way down here, then we'll bounce back and forth against the wall. And, and that'll hurt. Then we go to the next one, the next one, all the way up to the top, and I'm trying to remember where to put the skids in each of these curves, 13 of them in all. We get to the top, I'm hyperventilating, in part because I just walked a mile on a solid sheet of ice, for one thing, and the second, I, I'm convinced I'm going to die. This is it. This is when I, the news that night, I can just hear it. And in Utah, the governor of Arkansas tragically killed when the idiot tried to drive a bobsled when he'd never seen one. But just before we get in the bobsled and go down the hill, 
The kid says something to me that he had no idea how profound it was. Here's what he said. He said, when we come off the top of this hill, we're going to be picking up speed very quickly. Of that, I had no doubt. He said, when you see the, the curve in front of you, steer for it. As soon as you see it. Because by the time you've reacted to it, you're in it. He said, don't worry at all about the ice behind you. It can hurt you. <laughs> Implicit in that is, the ice in front of you can. <laughs> but he said, forget anything behind you. There's not a thing you can do about any mistake you think you've made. Forget everything behind and never look back. And he said, if you're in the curve and you think you've misjudged it, don't try to fix it inside the curve because centripetal force is going to be in control and taking you through the curve. But as soon as you come out, you'll see the next curve. As soon as you see it, steer for it. And by the time you've reacted to it, you're in it. And as soon as you've gone through that curve, look for the next one and steer for it. He said, there's really only one thing to remember. Steer for the curve ahead. Now, that kid had no idea that the piece of advice he just gave me was not just about driving a bobsled. It was about being a better husband, a better father, a better governor, a better business person. So sometimes we live our lives looking backwards. Nothing you can do about mistakes you have made. Forget about them. Quit reliving them. Get over them. And don't think you can fix everything in one moment. Quit worrying about what the stock market did today. I, I know people that look at it by the hour. I'm rich, I'm poor, I'm rich. No, you're not. <laughs> Quit looking at it every day. It'll drive you nuts. It's over a period of years that it matters, and it's going to fluctuate all over the place. Don't try to overcorrect. You cannot fix everything in one day. Don't even try. But just do one thing. One thing only, and it... It'll amaze you how well it works. Steer for the curve ahead. In your business, your finances, in your family, and even in your faith, your relationship to Christ. Steer for the curve ahead. Quit looking behind you. Get over it. Don't think you can fix everything in one moment. You can't. Steer for the curve ahead. And it's life-changing. And if you need some help doing that, I know the folks at Mach 1 would love to help you do it. Thank you very much. God bless you. David? Let's give the governor another hand, round of applause. Okay, my name is Mike Frost. I'm one of the financial advisors at Mach 1. There's three of us there. Uh, that's not important to you right now. What we want to know now is what's next. Well, don't leave. There's lots more to come. So here's the, we're getting ready for a halftime, if you want to call it that. So we're going to take a break. You can go out the doors. Again, the men's restrooms are out the hallway down here to the left. The women's are right over here. Now, as you go out, there's going to be some booths out there, the FCA booth. Mach 1 booth will be there. You saw the motorcycle out there. We're not giving that away tonight. We are giving away some prizes tonight, so you definitely want to come back. And you'll know when to come back because you're going to hear the voice of God speak. You're going to, five minutes. And then it'll be time to be working you back, way back in. The lights will flicker. And we're going to start at right on time. So plan to be right back. And in the meantime, you've got the number. Is the number there? Yep. If you have questions that you want to ask Governor Huckabee, and we've got a few other folks we're going to introduce later, go ahead and text those in, and we'll be sure they get those questions answered for you. Okay, so now, we've got about 15 minutes, so go out, have a break. There's water for sale out there. There's a dollar bottle. All proceeds go to FCA, so drink up. See you back in a few minutes. Most of you know that one of the recipients of uh, this evening is going to be the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. They're going to be... Uh, honored tonight, and it's an important thing. Uh, as I said to you before, you know, I was never a great athlete, so um, they didn't think I passed the physical to be in the FCA in high school. Um, but I remember our Hope High chapter 
of Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And I saw many of my friends and classmates completely transformed in their lives because of the one-on-one -on -one witness that they got from fellow athletes and the influence that some of the people in our state provided. I'll never forget, I was working at the local Hope radio station, KXAR. I know you've all heard of it. <laughs> 1,000 kilocycles, three bicycles, and a tricycle powered that station. But that's what I did from the time I was 14, and I did play-by-play -play sports and disc jockey and all sorts of stuff at the local radio station. One of the biggest moments I ever had was when Coach Frank Broyles came to Hope for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes for a big sports banquet and I got to interview him. And you have to understand, I was 14 years old, had a little cassette recorder, and I never had owned a suit in my life, so to go to that banquet, I had to go down to the department store in Hope and get a suit, first one I ever owned, and I was pretty proud of, you know, wearing a tie and a suit and all that. Now I'd give anything never to wear one again. Um, but I remember interviewing Coach Broyles, and his powerful testimony and witness about his relationship to Christ and the impact of FCA. And he brought three Razorbacks with him. I mean, it was just, that was the biggest thing I'd ever seen. I mean, you know, there's just nothing any bigger than meeting, honest to goodness, Arkansas Razorbacks. That was pretty cool, and Coach Broyles. Um, I saw what FCA can do in the lives of young students. And I think it's pretty important that we invest in FCA. And let me tell you one of the reasons why. This past year, a real tragedy happened. Um, many of you know Chick-fil-A uh, decided to pull their funding from Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Salvation Army, and the Paul Anderson Youth Homes, all three phenomenal Christian organizations. I'm not here to say bad things about Chick-fil-A, but I was very disappointed because I've seen what these organizations have done and how effective they've been. So one of the things that I'm happy about is that organizations like Mach 1 is trying to help FCA replace some of that funding. Uh, they don't have to do that. It's not part of, you know, financial services business, but they want to do it because they know that it's transformative in the lives of young people. Somebody that I have admired and appreciated is one of the great coaches of Arkansas's entire history. Um, phenomenal molder of young men, not just on the field, but off the field. And perhaps when we all get to heaven, I think he may be known more for what he did in shaping the lives of young men for eternity than just shaping the lives of winning athletes for a football season. But he has done both very well. I think you know I'm talking about Barry Lunny. He's here tonight, and we're going to ask him to... Um, uh, share a few things, but before Barry comes to tell us just a word or two about FCA, we're going to watch a little video that will give you some background of why this organization is worthy of our support. In 1954, God implanted into the heart of a basketball coach a vision that sports could be used as a vehicle to share the message of Jesus Christ. This idea was so compelling that it impacted the influencers. There is a reason for this fellowship of Christian athletes. Athletics has a place. Why this thing of fellowship of Christian athletes seems to have arisen in the mind of a few men but not just two or three gathered together, but millions of people everywhere dedicated to a common cause. The potential is almost beyond conception. Think of the power of this group through all the nations of the world. And that influence continues today. Nearly seven decades later, that vision is a reality. Ministering to and through 
the coach. Once we've engaged coaches and athletes, we're then equipping them, we're serving them. To ultimately empower them, men and women who are disciples who make disciples. We influence athletes from the young age all the way up to the pros. Now is such a critical time. Sport is larger than it ever has been. I see FCA being more relevant today than at any other time in history. Right at this very moment, our society, we are removing ourselves from the Word of God. So we produce FCA Bibles, God's Word, put to the culture and at the hands. Our camps continue to grow around the world. That's where I felt God's presence the most. Our numbers are growing. More cultures are joining a team. Doors opening, now serving in over 84 different countries. Truly fulfilling that vision. There's more to coaching than just winning medals. It's really about the impact you have in others' lives. I didn't get saved at a church. The FCA met me right where I was. We come to you exactly where you're at. By first reaching the coach, we have the opportunity then to reach every athlete. Uh, that's my job, raising leaders. And that's what's so powerful about the FCA. It's changing the dynamic of ministry. They go where you are. The ripple effect you're having on these kids and these coaches. And they're going to affect the community for generations. We want to walk through school and people see us and they be like, hey, I know that's a Christian because of the way we act. If we can change two people a day, just imagine how much that will grow. The impact, it goes full circle. I do still have that. It carries generations and generations. We can reach every coach, every athlete, every community, every country. To see the world transformed by Jesus Christ through the influence. The influence. The influence. Of coaches and athletes. The FCA. Fulfilling the vision. Good evening. Uh, it's, it's very hard to follow that uh, video, really. It, that video sums it up as about as good as you can sum it up. And I know this crowd is <clears throat> old enough to recognize some of the faces on there. Uh, you have to be careful who you're speaking to sometimes uh, and knowing your audience and who to relate to. But I know some of the faces there you saw on that video uh, you recognize. You know, in the spring of 1969, 51 years ago almost now, there was a high school football coach in Fort Smith, Arkansas, that was out in the community knocking on doors of businessmen, business leaders, going to different churches in our community, Fort Smith, raising money to take a bunch of high school football players, at his, his football team at Northside High School, to that camp that you saw in Estes Park, Colorado. He raised enough money to put uh, two charter buses, two Greyhound buses. That was my first trip on a Greyhound bus, let alone to uh, go to the mountains, to the beautiful scenery. Spent a week there with, uh, I think, approximately 500 other athletes from around the United States. Uh, went to have fun, to see the mountains, all that was Colorado, right? But while there, I got to see professional athletes, college athletes, come and lead and share their faith using this platform, what we're talking about, the athletic platform, the vehicle of FCA, to share their faith and their journey. And I was privileged while being there that year, to hear a guy named Tom Landry when the Dallas Cowboys were good and won America's coach, America's team. And I was about this close, Todd, to him. And I sat up on the front row and I listened to Tom Landry share his faith and his journey in Jesus Christ. And as a 16-year-old, almost 17 at the time, that message resonated with me and something I had never done in my life. And while I was there, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And it transformed this guy who was at a crossroads in his life, truthfully. And we don't have time to tell you, but I was at a crossroads of where I was going to go. And a coach did something. He saw enough in us. He believed in this enough to load us up and take two busloads of kids to Essence Park, Colorado. It changed my life. I'm going to tell you. One of the things that was said in the video that I just, it just caught, so I'm kind of changing what I thought. 
Uh, Mike Singletary, linebacker for Chicago Bears, said something that's still relevant today. It may be the most relevant thing today. FCA is about, and I can't say 100%, about the last Christian organization in the public schools that there is in the United States today. It is it. We still have, we still have access into the schools because it's a school club, student-led. We're ministering to and through the coaches because the influence of the coaches says. What, uh, Billy Graham that you saw in there said a, a coach will influence more people in one year than the average person will in a lifetime just because of being a teacher and the numbers of kids that come through life. It's not that they're any more important. It's just the facts. We have a new audience, a new congregation every year. But here's the numbers. We're here for a lot of reasons tonight, talking about numbers, stock market, and everything else. It's going up and down. But here's some of the latest numbers that are very alarming. We have, an, uh, we have an, a vehicle to get into the schools and don't think we're not being fought, even here in Arkansas. We are getting resistance. We're getting challenged. I just went to Pea Ridge High School not too long ago where they school board said that we no longer will have prayer at our sporting events. But they can. But see, the enemy barks and yells and threatens but the truth is on our side. Student-led, they can't stop it. So we're going to get that reversed. But it's always somebody challenging. But we're not backing down. I kind of love the fight. We win. But here's the numbers. I went to Kansas City a little over a year ago for some training. And some tremendous training. But the thing that I heard that really frightened me, it didn't frighten me, but broke my heart. Just... Broke my heart. 67% of high school age students nationwide do not go to church. 67%. What is that going to look like in a decade from now? I got nine grandkids. What is that going to look like in a decade? What's going to look like five years from now? Who is going to be there to bridge that gap? We have accesses. Churches don't have. They can't come in. We have it. FCA. God has given this organization. It's not about FCA, but it's about the vehicle. God has chosen at this time to use this vehicle through athletics, this platform, to, in our public schools throughout this nation to still be able to get the gospel in. The following week when I, that, uh, when I was up for my training, I was going to speak in Hot Springs at the Arkansas High School um, and University of Arkansas's Joint Spring Football Coaching Clinic. Almost a thousand coaches there. I was supposed to speak for the FCA breakfast that Sunday. As I drove down from Kansas City to there, my, I, with this number in my, in my heart, in my mind, I thought, I, I, I've got to do something different on my talk. And I sat in front of those coaches, and I shared this, that number. And I shared the story of Nehemiah that was shared. Most of you understand, Nehemiah number one, chapter 1. When he got the report that the walls were broken down back in Jerusalem. And he said he dropped and he wept. The walls are broken down around our youth. We have the opportunity through FCA to take it to them. They're not coming to churches. They're not attending churches. Where are they going to hear? And I told the coaches, you can be the biggest influence in those kids' lives. You can be the one by being a sponsor at the middle school the junior high school, the, uh, wherever it is, to, to, to be the sponsor for FCA, because you have to have a sponsor. You have to, it's a club, school club. And bring people in, business people from the community, youth pastors, sports personalities in your community to come and share their journey of their faith. They can be the, only, they can be the bridge for some 67% of these kids who will never hear the gospel, never hear the truth about Jesus Christ and his love for them and the redeeming power that he has in his life. What an awesome responsibility that is. It's an eternal. It's not a temporal. It's an eternal investment. I, I want to encourage you tonight to consider the numbers. Numbers make a difference. We're asking you tonight to consider, when you look at your, the little program that you have, and you can start filling that out if you haven't, and tear it out. We're getting ready to take up a an offering. If you want to know more about the ministry, you want to know more about what we're doing, 
You'll want to be able to support us. As Governor said, we've lost some support. I'm confident God's going to take care of that. I just know God's bigger than whoever decides not to give. Or You know why? You know, it doesn't matter. FCA, and I'm going to say it. I may get in trouble later, but who cares? You're going to fire me. <clears throat> why are we being looked at as, you know, not worthy to give or disassociating ourselves, basically, because of our stance on biblical marriage? Period. You know what? It's been the most contested thing in our society today. And it starts in Genesis. Here it is. In the beginning, God. Period. That's the whole battle. It's over our God. Our creator God. And who gave order and purpose for the family and individuals. It's broken in our society. These kids... Or again, we're, the number one area of discretionary income that's being spent in the United States, and this was two years ago, so I may, my numbers may be off a little bit. Number one area of discretionary income in the United States being spent, youth sports. Kids are playing sports. And we have the opportunity to make a difference for our community and for the youth of this nation. An eternal investment, not a temporal one, but an eternal one. So if you have an opportunity, I think, am I supposed to call forth the ushers right now for the collection? Oh, I'm not. So uh, I, I could listen. Everybody here that knows me would tell you that I'm just warmed up, but I'm going to have to stay on schedule. They threaten me with my life. I'd really like to get into a halftime talk right now. But thank you. Thank you for Mach 1. Thank you that Governor Huckabee, aren't you glad he's one of us? I mean, aren't you just glad... You know, we live, in a, we live in a small state, and we're all connected, and we're darn proud of it. I hope you understand that. Thank you again for coming. All right. Thank you, Coach Lonnie. Um, we're going to go ahead and transition into the panel part of the program. Um, so we want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, hopefully you've been texting in some questions over the last hour or so. Uh, Mike Frost is back here in the back going through those. and um, So we're going to try to get to as many of those as possible. Um, first, I want to kind of introduce um, the panel. I'm Matt Walters uh, with Mach 1 Financial Group, and I'll just be moderating the event. But we have four fantastic uh, men up here on the panel with us tonight. <clears throat> first of all, David Lee, many of you know. Uh, but David's the founder and CEO of Mach 1 Financial. Um, after serving nearly a decade in the U.S. Air Force as an F-16 fighter pilot, uh, David started the business seeking a more stable life for um, his wife and family. And since 2005, David's worked diligently to protect the retirement assets of hundreds of retirees in northwest Arkansas. Um, he holds a Series 65 life insurance, and he's a registered financial consultant. Uh, next, next, to, next to David, we have Doug Wolf, who's the president of Security Benefit Life. As the pres president of Security Benefit Life, Doug oversees product development, pricing, operations of Security Bene Benefit Life, First Security Benefit Life of New York, and F Security Financial Resources. Um, he has over 30 years of experience in actuarial pricing, product development, financial consulting, marketing investments, and strategy formulation. Um, he's also a chartered financial analyst and a fellow on the Society of Actuaries. Um, next to Doug, we have Jay Pestratelli, who many of you have heard. We, we have Jay in um, once or twice a year and do a lot of events with Jay. Jay's the CEO and Managing Director of uh, Zega Financial and leads the development and execution of the firm's investment strategies. Zega's founding principles grew out of the best-selling book Jay co-authored entitled Buy and Hedge, The Five Iron Rules of Investing Over the Long Term. And Jay has been a re regular contributor on NASDAQ Trade Talks, TD Ameritrade Network, and is regularly quoted in top news outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, TheStreet.com, Market Watch, World Report, Fox Business, and CNBC. And if you haven't heard Jay talk, Jay's originally from Jersey, so he kind of has a funny accent. So just to give you a heads up. I got no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> but that was my southern accent I threw on there. I'm sorry. Um, and then obviously, Mike, uh, Governor Mike Huckabee um, needs no introduction. 
uh, 44th governor of Arkansas and a New York Times bestselling author. And Governor, we appreciate you sticking around and being a part of the panel. Thank you. Well, I'm uh, very delighted to be here. I think I get to do the first question. And uh, I think since we've been talking about FCA and we've heard a very powerful presentation, both in video and by Coach Lunny, maybe, uh, David, let's, let's talk about the benefits, how a person can contribute to FCA, but make it a part of their own giving, their own tax benefits, because sometimes people say, well, what's the real advantage? Well, the advantage is obviously the young people, but there's also a financial advantage in contributing to FCA. Maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so first, to your point, uh, first of all, we obviously want to give um, from our hearts. You know, the Bible tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. But if we're going to be giving anyway, and I know most of you in the audience already give to your church and various charities, there are smart ways to give from a tax perspective. Um, so uh, you mentioned earlier, Governor, it looks like, you know, most of you in the audience probably aren't still in college. So uh, for those of you who are over the age of 72 uh, and you're having to take out what are called required minimum distributions, one great idea of how you can give tax efficiently to a charity like uh, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes is you can give your required minimum distribution, that's the amount of money that the government requires you to take out every year out of your qualified plans like IRAs, you can give that in a tax efficient manner. The way it's called a qualified charitable distribution, you take it, you take out the amount that you're required to take out and you have that amount go directly to the church or charity of your choice. As long as the charity is a 501c3 charity, which FCA is, you can have that gift designated directly from your IRA custodian directly to the charity of your choice. So why is that more tax efficient? Well, if it's going directly to the charity, never coming through your hands, it, it stays off of your tax return. So you're, you're not realizing any of that income, uh, yet you're still complying with the government's requirement to take that out of your IRA. Again, this is if you're over 72. Um, you, the uh, charity, of course, gets to receive all of it uh, without paying any taxes on it. And since you, since it never shows up on your tax return, let's say you're in a 22% tax bracket. Well, if, if you just take that money out and you receive it, yes, you're getting to, and then if, let's say you take it out, you receive it, you turn around and you give it all to Fellowship of Christian Athletes. You, you get to claim that as a deduction, but if you're in the 22% tax bracket, you're effectively only saving yourself 22% on that gift. Whereas if you give it directly to the charity, you're, you're essentially realizing 100% of the tax benefit of that gift because it's never showing up on your tax return. So for those of you who are over 70, uh, 72, that's a great way, I would call it a no-brainer way to give to charities that you're, especially charities that you're already giving to, it's just a, a much more tax efficient way of giving that gift. Um, some other ideas, if you have highly appreciated stock, whether it's Walmart or Hormel or whatever it may be, you have, if you have highly appreciated stock with a low cost basis, you can give that stock as a gift to a 501c3 in a very similar manner. You give it directly as stock directly to the charity of your choice. They receive it in their brokerage account. They sell it in their brokerage account. Since they're a 501c, they're, they're getting no, uh, they have no tax on that. Um, you don't, you don't, you avoid the capital gain tax by giving it directly from your brokerage account. So those are two, two ideas that many of you may know about. Some of you may not know about it qualified charitable distributions. And then the one I just described. And then finally, there are other, um, ideas such as um, charitable remainder trust, charitable lead trust, and things like that, that you can, uh, uh, charitable gift annuities. There are a lot, lots of good ways to give uh, to charities that you care about, like FCA, in more tax-efficient ways. Yeah, very good. So um, this next question is for you, Governor Huckabee. I think um, from what I'm hearing, it's the most common question. We got, got a flood of these. So everyone wants to know, did you make it to the bottom of the bobsled run? <laughs> I'm here, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, I did make it. Uh, I actually came in second. 
Mike Levitt, the governor of Utah, who was our host, came in first, but I think it was rigged. Um, <laughs> he was the host. Look, I was just glad to get down there alive, and I'm telling you, this is no uh, story. I've never been so terrified in my life. Absolutely scared to death the whole way down, but I made it, and I'm here to tell about it. <laughs> so that's a big deal to me. I lived through it. Would I ever do it again? Not on your life. Yeah. <laughs> and a reminder to everyone as we're going through this, don't hesitate to start filling out your tear sheet. Um, we'll collect those here in a bit. Um, let's see, next question. Um, so Doug, we'll, we'll send this one to you. What type of strategies should clients be considering that don't like to experience the type of market swings we have seen over the past couple of weeks? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, and th <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, uh, so, so one of the, you know, um, products um, that can work real well in this type of environment is called a fixed indexed annuity, and uh, you know I know I know David could talk talk more about it uh, if anyone wants more details. But at the highest level, it's a way to get some participation in the upside of the market with uh, none of the downside. So. You do, you know, nothing's for free, right? You do give up some uh, of the upside, but the key is uh, that you're covered on the downside. So, uh, you know, year after year, the, the account value uh, of the variable annuity would never go down. And um, in the industry in total, uh, and in the United States, that's kind of the fastest growing of any of the annuity products, specifically because uh, of what it offers and how it fits into a lot of different people's portfolios because of the fact that it, it takes the downside of the market out of the equation. Yeah, uh, okay. Um, all right, so this one, Jay, I think I'm going to give this one to you. So um, a question that came in, we have two kids. We have a brokerage account and index funds. Are there any other options out there that are flexible and also have tax advantage status? So couple different parts there, but. Yeah, so the, the question, thank, again, thank you, David and uh, Matt for having me. Mike, you as well, thank you for uh, allowing us to be here. Um, I do think that um, when you're answering the question about index funds, um, there's, they're very popular. They are uh, vehicles that a lot of folks use because you don't have to pick stocks. It's actually a very difficult job to be right when you pick stocks. Most stocks actually don't beat the indexes, right? So being a good stock picker is difficult. So index type products, if you're thinking about things like ETFs or mutual funds, they are, um, uh, they actually uh, give you a lot of choices on how you want to create your exposure. And so if the question was specifically around, you know, a more tax efficient way to do that, um, I think, you know, using those types of products with, uh, you know, say specifically, um, uh, you know, plans in the future so that you're not kind of capturing regular short-term gains. You're looking for long-term growth. The downside of those is you get the kinds of weeks that we're having, right? Um, uh, I'll say it's been, let's say, two weeks since the market got really uh, uh, enthusiastic about showing its fear regarding, well, we're not sure if it was coronavirus or if it was the election, uh, the Democrats. I, I'm not sure exactly what is the cause yet, but it doesn't really matter. There's always going to be a coronavirus. There's always going to be uh, uh, a conflict with Iran. These things will always be prevalent. And so um, as you're uh, managing for the long term and you have children and you're investing them in the long term, having uh, some level of risk avoidance is really, really important. Um, we know that uh, uh, you mentioned our book, Buy and Hedge. It really is about long term investing. But there are better ways to do it and to do it in a way that's protected. Uh, the annuities that uh, were just mentioned are definitely one of the ways to do it. Um, but if you're looking for more growth for your children, um, having exposure to the indexes is really important. Um, it takes away uh, the risk that you have to pick the next Apple or the next Amazon. Um, you know, even stocks like that, that really are the darlings of this market, forget about what's happened in the last two weeks, um, they really have been very, very strong. They were not always that way. And it's very difficult to do that. So, you know, for us, when we take a look at it, we do like using the broader markets uh, as the benchmark, as the way to invest. We think that's a great way uh, for long-term investing for children and for yourself, um, holding those assets, but in a risk-managed way, and I think we'll probably talk a little bit more about that later, is also really important. Um, the simple math, 
when it comes to why you want to manage risk is the following. If you have a dollar and you lose half of it, it's a 50% loss. You need 100% growth to take that 50 cents back to a dollar. The math works in your advantage to limit that downside. The math works for you. And by the way, it doesn't matter what's in the portfolio, right? This isn't picking stocks or anything, but the math works for you such that the rebound is twice as hard in that example I just gave you. But if you could limit that loss to say 10%, it only takes 11% to get back to even. So the management, whether you are just investing or really uh, getting towards retirement and you need protection but still some growth, risk management is really important. And index type ETFs and mutual funds are a great way to do it. I'm not sure if I got the whole question there. I think you covered it. All right, it. and then yeah. a little more maybe. <laughs> All right, so this next question, Governor, um, is actually for you, and it's one I had written down here. I think, um, I think it's a question we've all probably asked ourselves, especially over the last few months, but how do you see the market reacting um, if we do have a new president in 2020? I, I think it would depend on who that person would be. If, uh, if we go back four years ago, you may remember that Paul Krugman, New York Times financial guy, made the prediction that if Donald Trump were elected, the stock market would crash and would never, ever recover. <laughs> That's Paul Krugman, who's got to be one of the dumbest piles of brick that ever wrote for a newspaper. Uh, clearly, he missed the whole point. And what he didn't understand was that when government cuts taxes, it reduces the cost for both individuals and businesses to be able to do business. And it gives them working capital with which they can hire people, build inventory, invest in new facilities and our products, research and development. You know, it, it's not that complicated. So lowering the tax rate, which this administration did, freed up capital. But the second thing that I think is as big as the tax consequence was this, deregulation. For every regulation, that was created, seven regulations were cut uh, over the past four years. This is huge, or I should say, this is huge. <laughs> um, but the reason that's important is because, you know, I, I own some businesses, I know many of you do, or you have, and it's not just what you pay in taxes, it's how much hassle you get, not from your competitors or even your customers, but from your own government that makes it hard to be able to be profitable. And the less the government is interfering with you by trying to tell you how to do a business they've never done but you've made a living out of it, uh, it again creates a market environment uh, that is very powerful. So I think the question is, what would happen if maybe we had a different administration? Then the question would be, well, who would be leading it? If Bernie leads it, you're gonna feel the burn. Um, and again, I'm not trying to be overtly political, not endorsing, I'm just telling you this is a, a fact, because if you believe that you can tax people up to 90% and anybody wants to work and only keep 10% of their income, or even 20, uh, please come and see me afterwards, because I, I promise you, I know some good psychiatrists, they can help you. <laughs> they can really help you if you really believe that people will work and not get any of the money. Folks, the Beatles left Great Britain in the 60s when the British tax rate was 90%. The Rolling Stones went to France. They're rock stars, they're not even financial gurus, but they had that much sense. And why are people leaving New York and California? And by the way, they are, by the millions. Um, because they're getting away from the regulatory and the tax environment. So I, I think it's really important to understand that the direction of the country politically, uh, as people see whether they embrace capitalism or socialism is a real key factor in what kind of financial environment. I go back to Krugman. Krugman didn't understand that business will respond favorably to a lower tax environment and to a lower regulatory environment. And it wasn't some magic wand that President Trump was a part of. He simply did what I think he understood as a business person that every business person understands. Quit taking all my money away from me and I might be able to do something with it that would include paying people more, hiring more people, putting people in the workforce. That's why we have the lowest unemployment numbers that we've had 
for many of us in our lifetime and the best employment numbers for African Americans, women, Hispanics, and youth uh, because people can afford to hire. Yeah. All right, Jay, this next one is for you. And this is one that we see a lot, specifically in Northwest Arkansas, um, just because of Walmart and their presence here and the, the, the vendor community. So someone asked, you know, saying, I have a lot of Walmart stock. How can I protect its current value? And I think to, to get a little bit more detailed on that, you know, let's say, for example, someone has um, a lot of highly appreciated stock, right? So they're, they're nervous about that exposure, um, but maybe they can't sell it for tax reasons. Is there anything that, that we can do with our partnership working with Zega? What can we do for someone like that? Yeah, one, one of the, um, the things that we do that's pretty unique uh, with Mach 1 is we actually help protect individual stock names. Um, and what does that mean? We call them hedges. A lot of people hear the term hedges and think hedge fund. Sometimes they think of the hedges in front of their front yard, you know, I mean, but that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> we're talking about the concept of hedging your bets or putting something into the portfolio that offsets uh, uh, the longer term investment. And we use options for this. And options, um, for those of you, maybe I can ask for a little brief audience participation. How many folks in here have ever heard of the term options? Show of hands. Wow. Awesome. That was way more than half. That's way more than I thought. That's great. So uh, options are a vehicle that um, usually you hear about them as a speculative vehicle. Everybody talks about warning about options, but there's actually no better way to manage risk, mathematically manage risk, than the use of options. And with large companies like Walmart, there's a lot of other large companies here in town uh, that we could go through, but uh, uh, I think it's easier to offload that risk by the use of options, and they can help put a floor in that portfolio. Um, let's say you wanted to sell it, but the tax burden would be too much uh, because it would put you to another tax bracket and you wanted to get rid of the risk of it, but you just couldn't. And sometimes time is not your friend and you need to spread it out a little bit. Um, things like options will allow you to create protection, allow you to plan your exits, and actually even get paid a little bit while you're doing it. Um, so, you know, we talk about things like collars, if you've ever heard of that. It's really a, a protective bracket that you put on the stock. So while you're waiting for liquidation, it provides a level of protection for you. Um, heck, uh, you could even use them and make some profit when the market is down. If you don't want to sell the stock, you can actually cash in those hedges, right? You could cash in those, that protection and generate a little cash as well. So um, we do this a lot. Um, I would say probably... You know, a fifth of my business is actually hedging individual names for folks that have uh, 500, a million to three, four million dollars in a specific stock, but they can't sell it because of the tax burden just yet. Or maybe they don't want to. Um, we have some folks that I just like living, they live off the dividends or their grandfather gave it to them, right? Or there's an emotional reason why they want to hold on to the stock. It's okay to do that. But there's no reason to have unprotected stock, right? Uh, Walmart, I think this past week, took a 15% hit alone. And that was one of the better ones, right? So uh, it's, it's, it's the nature of that derivatives market that we can do with Mach 1 that I think is pretty unique. And we do a lot of it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Doug, I'm going to give this next one to you. You run a very successful annuity company, right? You've seen the interest rate environment and what the Fed recently did there. Um, this question is, what impact do you see the spread of the coronavirus having on the economy over the next, say, nine months? You saved the easy one for me. Thank yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I take out my crystal ball, I mean, I, you know, all kidding aside, I mean, I, obviously there's concern, um, you know, not just, you know, economically, but in terms of how it might affect people, people relating to other people. Um, sickness and even, you know, resulting in worse for some, right? And, but we all know, you know, common influenza kills thousands of people in the United States uh, every year. And sometimes, you know, media hype and other things can, can make things seem worse than they actually are. Now, things could get worse, and there are some challenges in terms of, you know, if, if people do stop traveling, halt traveling, um, stop getting together in meetings. There could really be, you know, a, an effect on the economy. You're starting to see some predictions. And we've seen interest rates come down quite a bit. Um, you know, I think the key to all of this from an investment standpoint, right, is 
If you're properly diversified, you're investing for your long-term goals and objectives, you're investing according to your long-term risk tolerance, usually what I hear the most sensible advice is stay the course. Don't panic. If you thought a stock um, or a mutual fund or something else that's a little bit more risky was well valued, you know, was well valued before this all started, then odds are it's even better valued now. That doesn't necessarily mean run out and go buy it, right? You want to stick to your long-term plan, again, your goals and your risk tolerance, but it certainly doesn't mean um, to just kind of willy-nilly start selling things. And again, this is where the help of a financial professional and the folks at Mach 1, I think, can, can be and will be really helpful because the key really is staying the course and staying to your long-term plan. No matter what effect coronavirus ends up having, you know, short-term on the environment or on certain markets and interest rates. Yeah. Um, David, I'm give this next one to you. So we hear... Um, we talk, we've talked about this a lot over the last year with the, the tax cut that we saw go into effect um, a couple years ago. And, you know, depending on how the election comes, this, this, this is going to be a major impact moving forward. But um, something that people have been talking about a lot is converting maybe tax-deferred dollars, tax-qualified dollars that they haven't paid taxes on yet to a, to a Roth IRA. Um, when would that make sense? Does it make sense? And what does that help protect down the road? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and, and especially timely because of the, the market being uh, down significantly off its recent highs. Uh, this could be a great time for some of you uh, to strongly consider converting to a Roth IRA. Don't just go out and do it on your own. Definitely come in and talk to us or to whoever you're, you're currently working with before you take that step. But the, the reason why you might want to think about converting to a Roth is because once you convert to a Roth, you've paid taxes forever. Um, so to, briefly to explain the difference between a regular IRA and a Roth. In a, inside a regular IRA, the dollars grow in there tax deferred. Most of you probably know that. And then down the road, when you retire and you start withdrawing those funds, you pay taxes at whatever the tax rates are um, and based on the, the value of the account uh, and your age and other factors. But mainly the, the main factor that determines how much tax you pay when you take that out is going to be a function of the size of the withdrawal and the tax bracket that that, that puts you into. So um, the real risk is what happens if, you know, God forbid we get a socialist type president, either this election or at some future election, and tax rates double or even go up by more than double. Now you're in a situation where down the road the government's still forcing you to pull that required distribution out that we spoke of earlier but now you're being forced to pull that distribution out at a much higher tax rate. Whereas you could convert today while tax rates are at or very close to historic all-time lows, thanks to the tax cuts that Governor Huckabee alluded to a minute a, a moment ago. So you could take out at an all-time low or near all-time low tax rates. And when the market is down, you're, it, you, you're converting more at a, at a point where the market is lower you get it moved to that Roth where it's tax-free forever. Now that gr Roth grows back and there is no required distribution on a Roth IRA. So the government's never going to come, come along and tell you, okay, you're 72 now. You got to start taking big chunks out so that we can tax you on it. You, when you, whenever you start taking money out of that Roth IRA, it's free of federal tax, state tax, capital gain tax, it doesn't uh, count towards something called provisional income, which determines the uh, tax rate you pay on your Social Security income. So it has all other, uh, all other, uh, a lot of other unanticipated benefits uh, when you convert to a Roth IRA. It's definitely something you need to think about. Definitely need you, something you need to um, go over, consult with your investment advisor, your financial advisor, uh, your CPA with. But definitely something that probably a lot of you in this room should consider doing. Yeah, Jay, I'm going to um, give you this one. You can have fun with this one if you want. A question from the audience. So what portion of, reti of your retirement portfolio should be placed in precious metals, cryptocurrency, and REITs? Cryptocurrencies. All right. <laughs> so uh, listen, this is, um, uh, these are what are known as uh, alternatives, right? It's not stocks. It's not bonds. It's not cash. These are how we would categorize these as uh, uh, alternative assets. 
Um, there's a place for these for most people. Uh, again, it's all dependent on you and your growth targets and your goals. Um, I, you know, I, uh, uh, everybody always throws in, and your risk tolerance, and I think it's important to know your risk. If, if I was to ask anybody right now, how's your risk tolerance right now, most people would be like, oh, I don't think I want too much more risk, right? We're, it's a, it feels a little nasty in the market right now. But again, it's really about how are these vehicles going to hit, uh, help you hit your growth goals and your growth targets. So if you're somebody that uh, uh, is aggressive, certainly things like you know Bitcoin and cryptos in your uh, portfolio could have a you know two, three, four percent place. That's probably on the higher end. One percent is probably what you know people like to dabble in these days. It is a new and interesting asset class. I think we will find that as it eventually stabilizes over time, uh, there will be value. Uh, to that in our future. So having some exposure to it is worthwhile. REITs, uh, which stands for Real Estate Investment Trust, REITs are a good source of alternative income. Um, geez, when we look at what bonds are paying these days, it's difficult to get the yield that you may need for income. REITs can have a portion uh, in your portfolio of that. Um, again, it depends on the individual vehicles that you're talking about, but they are a replacement for uh, income type vehicles. And so if you have a portfolio that is a little more weighted to bonds because you need income, great. REITs can, REITs can fit in there. Again, it's a it could just be a portion of your income piece. Gold is a different story. I'm going to use gold and silver uh, as the precious metals. Um, you know, gold right now is acting as a great hedge against market fear. Gold has historically been uh, an inflation hedge because it always takes, you know, how many dollars can I buy uh, does it take to buy an ounce of gold? Uh, the more the dollar is worth, right, that changes the value of the gold. Um, it is doing very well right now. It has been a safe haven. Um, but that is only recently, right? It has fallen out of favor since uh, 08, 09, um, when it did have a previous run. And just now it's starting to even get close to those levels. And so, you know, gold, again, is um, for the way that we view gold, it's it's fine, it doesn't provide a lot of value, there's no dividend to gold, you don't make anything with gold except things like jewelry and precious coins, and those have some intrinsic value. You wanna buy some gold coins and put them in your, in your safe because you feel like you've got some assets, go ahead, again, it shouldn't be a significant portion of your portfolio because the growth aspect of it is tied to very little. What we used to think it was tied to, it's really not. The market has certainly had its ups and downs between you know 09 and now, and gold hasn't done any had any growth. So again, if you you know want to speculate on the growth of gold, fine. It should have a, it could have a small portion, but not very much. Again, all of these are what we would consider alternatives. Um, they probably in total shouldn't make up more than 20% of your portfolio. I don't care who you are. All right, um, David. I think you're you're best for this next one. So. Um, really good question. My dad picked stocks. He paid attention to the financial fundamentals and made decisions that way. But today it seems like the market is driven by emotions and not fundamentals. So how do we at Mach 1, some of the strategies we use, how do we manage money? Yeah, I, I love that question. Uh, markets are driven by two human emotions, fear and greed. And it seems like uh, most of the time, especially when it comes to markets, fear is a more powerful emotion than greed. People get fearful. Um, people are uh, more afraid of losses than they are pleased by gains, I guess is a good way of saying it. So that's why markets seem like they always go down faster than they go up. Uh, so how do we manage that, I think, was the question. Um, while it's true that, you know, many of us here on stage tonight have even said, the important thing is when markets go crazy, just to stick to your long-term plan, we all know that sometimes that can be easier said than done right? Easier said than done because you look at it and you think, oh my goodness, how, you know, how low, how much lower can this thing go? There's a saying out there that says the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. Okay. So how do we manage that? We, number one, we diversify, by the way, uh, Governor Huckabee and I were talking about this on the drive over here this evening. Diversification is actually in the Bible. Any, any of you know that? It's Ecclesiastes 11.1. 1. He says, cast your bread upon many waters, and after many days you will find it again. Divide your portion among seven or eight, 
because you do not know what disaster may befall the land. So what's he saying? What was Solomon saying there? He's saying, don't put everything in one ship and send it to all the ports because what if that ship sinks? Put, upon, put your treasures in all these different vehicles, send them out, and after many days, you will find it again. Sometimes it takes time for you to get a return on investment. And then he says, divide it among seven or eight different things, different, we would call that asset classes, divided among seven or different, eight different things. We do that at Mach 1. That's how we manage money. Um, we use uh, some of Jay's strategies. We, we have a, a hedged equity strategy where we it's, think of it as investing in an index fund, which is a broadly diversified basket of stocks, but we hedge it in case the market tanks. We want a maximum exposure to loss of about 8 to 10%. That prevents people from being their own worst enemy of saying, oh my goodness, the sky is falling. I'm, as you said earlier, I love the way you put it. Oh, I'm rich, I'm poor. I'm rich, I'm poor, right? It prevents that, oh my goodness, I'm getting poor really quickly. I need, I'm going to make a bad financial decision and bail out. We put that hedging in place for you so that you don't have to do that. The hedge does that for you. That's one of the portions we would put the money in. Another portion would be the vehicle that Doug talked about tonight called an indexed annuity. We use that as a bond replacement alternative. In an environment where interest rates are practically at zero and the market is going crazy, where do you turn for income and safety? Annuities is the, the vehicle that Mach 1 chooses. Or we also have a high probability option strategy that's an alternative asset class, which Jay just addressed, that we'll use for a portion to generate high income uh, for a client's portfolio, typically for a very short season of time, or for a long period of time, as long as we've got our exposure really limited to maybe 10 or 15%. Um, and then we use uh, another a stock strategy that uses artificial intelligence to pick stocks, and then we use options to mitigate that risk. Our, uh, our artificial intelligence manager, Wayne Ferbert, is in here somewhere. There he is. In the front near the front so we use a number of strategies using going back to that ecclesiastes verse cast your bread upon many waters it sometimes it may take you many days to find a return divide it up and it will work all right and quick reminder before we go to the next question don't forget the tear sheet um we'll be collecting those in, in just a bit so governor this is one that this is one i've thought a lot about and you kind of hear both sides some people say National de debt doesn't matter, right? We'll just print more money. Um, but I think it's an important question. So um, someone asked, please discuss the effect of national debt on the economy and individual retirement accounts if Washington does not manage it in the near future. National debt does matter uh, because at some point it's got to be paid. Uh, I think it's a matter of is, if it's manageable. Probably most everyone here has some debt. Maybe it's in their home, maybe it's in our business. And the question is not do you have debt, but is it manageable debt? Do you have assets that will cover it? Right now we don't. We, we're $23 trillion in debt. That's staggering. And if you start spreading that out, it's, it looks impossible. There's two things that, that will not get us out of the indebted situation. One, you cannot tax us out of debt because you would have a detrimental effect upon the economy. So it would be a disastrous policy move to say we're going to raise taxes to get rid of the debt. If you raise taxes, you're going to increase the debt because now you're taking money out of the private economy. You're taking people away from employment and into government dependency. Government dependency, government spending is why we're into the debt we're in. So the last thing would be tax increases to do it. The other option that you hear people say is cut spending. Cutting spending would be delightful. Uh, I'm personally involved. I'm on the board of an organization uh, that is seeking to get a balanced budget amendment to the U.S. Constitution through uh, an Article 5 procedure. We're in about 34 states right now, and, and I think Congress will never balance its budget until it has to. Every state balances its, its budget because it's law. So I could bo boast about the fact that when I was governor, by golly, we balanced the budget because I didn't want to spend the rest of my term in Tucker or Cummins. It was pretty simple. I knew all those prisons pretty well, and there wasn't one of them I want to spend the night in, much less several years. 
So of course we balance the budget. Congress doesn't because they don't have to. And quite frankly, government usually only does what it's required to do. I think we need a balanced budget amendment that would force Congress to do what you do in your homes, what you do in your business, and that's uh, balance your budget. I, I want to mention something, though, about in terms of the individual accounts, and specifically Social Security. Uh, if you r may remember, one of the things that I talked about in both 2008 and 2016 presidential races, which uh, maybe you'll remember that, not how the races turned out. Um, <clears throat> that wasn't the most pleasant landing of all. But the one thing that, that I talked about was that Social Security is not an entitlement. I hate it when I hear politicians say, we've got to cut these entitlements. Uh, and they mention Social Security. Social Security is not an entitlement. It's your money. You paid it. You didn't pay it voluntarily. The government took it from you at a time when you could have sure used it, but they took it from you. And the problem is not that you paid in. The problem is that they took the money that you pay in and they spent it on stuff that had nothing to do with you. So it was their mismanagement. If Social Security is going broke, it's not because you broke it. It's because the people that took it from you broke it and we shouldn't let them off the hook. But I really resent it. I get angry and I get very vocal when people speak of Social Security as an entitlement. I know when I was 14, I got my first job that required taking out money to pay uh, Social Security tax. Uh, you know, my first, well, what's this about? Well, Social Security, you're gonna get that back someday. Uh, so, you know, I, I could have used that when I was 14, 18, 22. Probably could still use it. Um, <laughs> But the government doesn't say, Mike, would you, would you like to make a little contribution here? Folks, this isn't giving money to the FCA voluntarily. They take it out whether I like it or not, and it comes out before I get paid. So that's money that you've paid, I've paid, we've done it now for our whole lives. And then to come when I hit 65 or 62 or 70 or whenever it is, I think I'm ready to start getting it and say, hey, we've decided that all that money you've paid in, we're keeping it. I'm just saying to heck with that. Uh, so I, I think we all need to be very clear in holding the members of Congress and our administration, um, hold their feet to the fire about saying, if you want to cut some stuff, there's a lot of things that you know are discretionary. But this is not the government's money. This is money that you, as a worker, you paid it. It should be there for you. And if you'd have taken that money and put it in an annuity, if you'd have had the option of putting it in a savings account or buying stock with it, uh, you'd be a very wealthy person if you took all that money and could have used it at the time you turned it into retirement. You didn't have that option, and the government shouldn't steal it from you twice. I think they liked that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, Doug, so here's an annuity question that someone asked. So how are taxes handled in regard, with regards to in fixed indexed annuities, and are there any fees associated with annuities? Way, this is, that was a tough one to follow up on, so now we go to an annuity question. Um, so a couple things. Um, annuities, ultimately when you take the money out, are taxed at, at ordinary income rates. But the key is you're not taxed on any of the gains in the annuity until you take the money out. So all the years that you can be getting returns on that, as long as you leave it in the annuity, that's all compounded tax-free. So that's where you get some advantages uh, in terms of tax deferral, as it's called, for being in, a, for being in an annuity. And you get those advantages because it's a long-term tool and, and a way for, uh, to help you, you know, save for your retirement. Um, I think the second question was around fees. Um, and so there, there's a couple different kinds of fixed indexed annuities, right? Kind of the base fixed indexed annuity, and David alluded to this earlier in, in his practice, they talk about it as a good alternative to um, other types of conservative investments like bonds, and bond mutual funds, and it works really well there. It can give you a little bit of an upside, can do well even if interest rates go up, so it has some advantages that, that bond mutual funds don't have. In addition to that, there's um, something often called a rider retirement guarantee 
that can be sold in addition uh, attached to the annuity. And think of that kind of like a, uh, your own individual personal pension. So on security benefits and um, fixed indexed annuities, the ones that we have this type of rider on, it means if you've purchased it, you can utilize it later to give you some guaranteed income in retirement for as long as you live. And so we're in the business with a lot of actuaries in our shop to um, take some risk and help you manage risk. And one of the risks that that can manage is um, you living a long time, and hopefully we will, right? You living a long time in retirement, not being able to outlive your money. The reason I mention that one specifically is that rider sold, in, you know, attached to an annuity typically does have a specific fee um, depending on what the rider does and what annuity it's sold on. But that one typically does have a specific, specific fee on it. All right, I really like this next one, David, because this is something that we just recently rolled out. Process hasn't changed at all, but the, the Mach 1 retirement flight plan. It's good to know that someone actually noticed. Um, so someone was asking, what is the Mach 1 retirement flight plan that keeps popping up here on the screen? And the second part of the question is, um, do, do we at Mach 1 have a minimum that someone has to have to start an account with us? Okay, good question. I don't know if it's possible for you guys up there in the control to put that slide up, the one with the four blue circles. If not, it's, yeah, there you go. Um, so what is the Mach 1 retirement flight plan and what's our minimums? So this is just our process. We just have recently kind of created this uh, branding and we're in the, getting ready to be in the process of, process of trademarking it. It's what we've always done. We've just kind of put a name to it. So we call it the Mach 1 Retirement Flight Plan uh, based on my, flight, my uh, flight history that Governor Huckabee talked about earlier. And basically, this is the process that we would go through for any mission that we would go out and execute in the F-16. It starts with, what's your goal? You know, go put bombs on target at a certain time and come home alive was a typical one. Uh, and then... <laughs> And then, uh, then you'd have a, a briefing where you get together with all the players involved and figure out how are we going to do this and, and achieve our objectives in the best possible manner. Then you go out and you execute the plan and you record all the details of the flight. Then you come back in after you've, after you've done the flight and you come in and you debrief every little aspect of it to figure out what went wrong, what went right, what do we do better next time. We're going to do that tomorrow about this event, in fact. Uh, so we just took that same kind of fighter pilot process and we've applied it to retirement, flight, uh, to retirement planning. So what's your objective? Where are you going? That's what we would call the, the mission objectives. And then for the mission briefing, how do we get there? So what we would do is we would collect information from you and figure out where, where are you, where, where are you wanting to go, what is your goal, and then how do we get there in the most risk efficient way, taking the least risk while still accomplishing the goal, which typically is I need X amount of income and I want to make sure it doesn't run out for my life. And I'll, maybe I also have charitable goals to give to great organizations like FCA. Maybe I want to, you know, pass on a certain amount to my kids. So we figure out what's that, what's that objective? How do we get there? Then we execute it, we put a plan in place that has the minimum risk associated with the plan that will still accomplish the goal. And then we continually debrief, so to, so to speak, that plan by reaching out to all of our clients every quarter, saying, hey, it's time to come in and have a how goes it meeting, a debrief, so to speak. Every quarter reviewing, how are we doing? Have our goals and objectives changed? How are the, are the strategies performing as expected? If not, what adjustments do we need to make or what adjustments have we already made in many cases? And then we just continue to review and, uh, and update that plan on an ongoing process. So it's the same process we used as a fighter pilot. We just applied it to retirement planning and we call it the Mach 1 Retirement Flight Plan. And the second part of that question was the minimum. Oh, yeah. What does someone Minimums. have to have? Yeah, yeah. thank you. So we, we can work with people all the way from zero uh, to you know, millions of dollars. We've got people all over that spectrum. Now, I will tell you, we can't execute the, we can't use all of the various strategies that you've heard about tonight, um, you know, if we've got $1,000 to work with. But I would say we can, we can implement 
a pretty darn good strategy with about two hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Although we we have clients with definitely less than that. You know, a lot of times we're working with children of clients, and they're saying, "Hey, well, I've got my my kid that's just getting started. Can you work with him?" Absolutely. Everybody starts somewhere, so we can work with people all over the spectrum. But to really implement our Mach One retirement flight plan, I'd say two hundred and fifty thousand is probably a good minimum number to look for. All right, Jay, so um, this next one's for you. So we've talked about coronavirus. We've talked about the election. Um, someone asked if, if one of us, and I'm just I'm being nice and handing it to you, can, if, some, if one of us can explain the reason for the recent market volatility, is it really just coronavirus, the election? Is there something else there? Yeah, so let's, um, let's separate the market from the economy for a moment. Um, the market is a forward-looking vehicle. Typically, it trades about six months ahead of what the economy is doing. Um, recently, they were actually much closer, let's say, into January. People had a lot of positive outlooks in the, for the short term in the economy, and that was being reflected in the stock market as it pressed to new highs in the middle of February. But the market itself um, can be separated from the economy. Forget about the reasons why the economy might not be great going forward. When you look at the market, there are really two things that drive, the, uh, that drive market performance and market outlook. I know we talked about the emotion for a moment. I'm going to leave that out of this. There's two data points. What are companies going to make, corporate earnings, and what's the interest rate? Those are the two things that drive the market. Anything that happens in the economy can be equated back to one of those two items. So when you hear about the coronavirus may cause, you know, travel and hospitality companies to miss on earnings and it'll put us into a recession. It's a corporate earning question. Um, we are in the middle of seeing historic lows on the 10-year bond rate this week. Um, it's never been as low as it is right now, right? 90 basis points on the 10-year. It's never been that low. Low interest rates typically spur stock market growth, but they are acting in an adverse way right now because it's unknown what that will do to the market. We're in unknown territory, and the unknown usually drives fear that David was talking about. So when you think about what's causing market volatility, it is the rapid change of interest rates, it is the potential missing of corporate earnings from what they were projected. Now, I, d I will touch briefly just two seconds on the speed of the market change and the volatility of the market change. Um, you're absolutely right. Fear is is got the upper hand right now. Um, and what you will see when the government acted, a lot of folks thought, hey, cutting the cutting the the cutting rates seems like it's uh, not a smart thing to do. That's not that's not going to solve the coronavirus problem. Of, of course it's not. It's not going to stop people or make people go on vacation because rates are low. It may cause you to refinance. I'm going to tell you right now, we see 25 basis points on the 10-year I'm refinancing. Everybody in here should consider that, right? You give yourself a little raise. But when you see the unknown, um, you need to let it settle out, and you need to let that fear convert to greed. Now, we are in a, a place of worship here. I'm going to use a different term instead of greed. I think it's more of seizing an opportunity, looking for an opportunity of growth. So sometimes fear can overcome that, but there will be a point where all of a sudden things look really cheap. All of a sudden uh, the market has dropped fast enough that, hey, there might be that stock that I was looking for. And you know what? That stock price isn't so bad anymore because their earnings might not be affected. At that point, you will see the conversion from the fear of loss to the opportunity of growth. So I think that's what we're looking for, for the market to kind of find a little level. Um, there has been some real damage done technically to the market here. I mean, not you know, anything physically, but from a technical perspective, this quick drop is going to take a while for us to get through. This will take some time for us to get through it, even if we get good news about things that will impact earnings or uh, interest rates. But remember, those are the two things that drive the stock market. You name anything else. You want to name tariffs? That would have hit corporate earnings. Come up with anything. It affects one of those two things. Those are the two things that drive the market, and those right now are unknown unknown is usually associated with fear. Fear is the upper hand. Well, and since everybody loves your Jersey accent, I'm going to keep the spotlight on you. You want to do another one? Oh, all so, right. So uh, playing on that same question, 
I need to break out the crystal ball here. Someone asked, are we, so are we headed for a recession? And if, if so, if that's your, your belief or someone's belief, should that change how they invest? Oh, you're going to hate this answer. I don't care. And here's why I don't care. Um, and I'm going to use your story of the bobsled, if you don't mind. I'm going to steal it for a moment. Um, you know, it was nice when he walked you through the 13 curves. Yeah. You knew the curve that was coming. I know you never saw those curves before, yeah. but you got walked through the curve. Um, we are in a period of time where nobody has seen the curves that are coming up, but I like steering for the curve. And so steering for the curve ahead of you. And uh, things like a recession, we will have a recession. This is, we're not, we're not going to go, you know, no recession ever again in the United States. Of course we will have one. This is why we hedge. This is why David speaks of managing risk. You don't know when a coronavirus is going to matter to the market and earnings. You can't foresee that. Heck, I mean, Apple came out and warned of their earnings. Remember I just told you, corporate earnings drive the market price. They warned of earnings in January. Here's my jersey. Eh, nobody cared. <laughs> the market didn't go down. I was baffled. Like, wow, the biggest company in the, in the United States warned and the market didn't go down. Wow, there's a lot of complacency. And then boom, the market then took it seriously. You can't time that. You don't know when that's gonna happen, obviously. So, I don't care when the recession is gonna come. I know I've protected our investors because I've already limited their risk at the time we built the portfolio. Those hedges are built in day one. It's not, you know, there's not a market timing thing. There's not a, oh, as soon as it goes down enough, we're gonna get out, of, we're gonna go to cash and we'll be safe, no. They're built out of the gate. They're constructed for protection. So will we have a, a recession? Yes. Is it going to hurt? Yeah, OK. Everybody liked when their portfolios were maxed out at the end of January. Of course, everybody, everybody knows what their portfolio was worth at the end of January. We all know that. We all pay attention to that. And that number is in our head. But you protect that, and then it's OK when these things come and you see your way through it. So sorry that's, you know, I know someone wants an answer on recession or not. I don't care. Now, all of our clients that are here are going to call in and schedule a review and say, hey, are we ready if we're about to enter into a recession? So, what are you um, going to say? You're ready. Yeah. You're we, ready. We, I know you're ready. We plan from day one. Absolutely. So, um, David, I'll give this next question to you. So, as a lot of people know here, we're associated with Dave Ramsey and the Smart Investor Program. Um, but we have our differences, right? We, we don't necessarily agree with everything Dave Ramsey recommends. So, do we agree with his investing recommendations? Um, and then the second part of the question that they ask is, how, how do we get paid? Yeah. Um, so first of all, uh, we, Mike Frost, who some of you saw earlier, he came out and introduced, um, or he let you go to the restroom break at the end of the first half. He taught Financial Peace University here at this church for 12 or 14 years, long time. Uh, and um, so anyway, we are, as, you, as the question alluded to, we are a Dave, Dave Ramsey Smart Investor Pro, which just means we're kind of one of his uh, go-to guys, I guess you would say, for this region. Um, but like you said, Matt, we don't necessarily agree with everything. Uh, he talks about mutual funds that have averaged 12% a year for forever. Um, that That's not necessarily accurate. He talks about how you, it, there being you, you, you should have no problem finding a 12% per year mutual fund. That's not that's not accurate. I guess it depends on the 10 year period you looked at, but it's not as easy to find as what he makes it sound. The other thing that I would say about Dave Ramsey, where we kind of differ a little bit, he thinks you should be mutual fund and mutual fund only. There, there is no other investment vehicle known to man that Dave Ramsey likes as far as I've heard other than mutual funds. We obviously disagree. You can see that on through this panel discussion this evening. I would say Solomon and Ecclesiastes would agree with that approach, right? Cast your bread upon many waters, divide it amongst seven or eight. Don't put it all in mutual funds. That's an asset class. Uh, don't put it all in, in other words, don't put it all in stocks. Don't put it all in bonds. Don't put it all in real estate. Don't put it all in options. Don't put it all in annuities. Divide it among all of those things, and after many days you will find it again. So we would disagree with Dave in mainly in saying that we do not think that 100% of everybody's money ought to be in mutual funds, especially as you get in or near retirement. We think you ought to have a portion that's in zero risk annuities for either for risk aversion or risk downside protection and or 
lifetime income, like Doug alluded to. We, uh, we think any stock exposure that you should have should be hedged, like Jay has alluded to tonight, to, to mitigate that downside risk. So that's the main area where we would disagree. Yeah, all right. So we've got time for, for one more question. I want to remind everybody that um, to fill out the tear sheet, we have some volunteers Volunteers, if you'd go ahead and get ready, we're going to start in the back and work our way towards the front. And for these tear sheets are what we're going to draw from to give away the door prizes here in just a minute. Um, so time for one, one more question. If the volunteers would go ahead and start working their way and collecting the tear sheets. Let me see if. All right. Yeah, there we go. So um, naturally, Governor Huckabee, I, I saved the last question for you. I don't want to put you on the spot, but... Yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah I really do. do. We do. I really do. I've been looking forward to this all <laughs> night. So um, I, I know I've thought about it. I think a lot of us in this room have thought about it. You mentioned your, your daughter earlier. Um, is, is your daughter going to run for the governor of Arkansas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if I report the reaction that she got just by having it mentioned, maybe she should. Uh, the honest answer is she doesn't know yet. She very well may. So I'm not going to be coy and say, oh, she would never think about it. But she's not going to make any decision until we get through this election cycle. And she shouldn't. Nobody ought to be running for office for 2022 when we haven't even gotten through 2020. And she's busy right now helping other people get elected, which is what she ought to be doing and she'll make that decision after this election cycle. Uh, I think in a way, you know, from my perspective, I'd love to see her do it. I think she'd be great at it. Um, I think it would be kind of cool that she would go and live in the place where she grew up. Um, and the neat thing for me as a grandfather is that when her kids tried to hide, they couldn't because she knows all the great hiding places <laughs> that are already there. My wife and I actually lived in that place longer than any of the places we've lived in our almost 46 years of marriage. So, uh, you know, the only downside of it, we did get evicted. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, it was a, a wonderful place to live while we were there. <laughs> All right. Well, if you, if you would join me and give our panelists a round of applause and show your appreciation for them. So, so David and Governor Huckabee, if you would uh, stay on stage, we're going to draw for the door prizes, and then we'll present a check to F FCA shortly thereafter. Okay. Yeah, they're going to come Okay. Okay. All right, we got to get our big tub that we got to mix these all up in so that we're fair. Okay, we're ready to do the drawing. We've got three prizes, so we'll, we'll knock this out real quick, and then we'll give a, a check to FCA and let you guys all go home for the evening. So, Governor Huckabee, I'm going to let you do the honors. You know, the bad part <laughs> of this, when you're the one that does the drawing, you make three people happy and everybody else hates you for the rest of their lives. That's I should have let you do it. and he picks, but here we go. Okay, as you can tell, I'm not looking for my own name here. Let's see, this one. Averta Canifax. All right. All right, Averta. 
See, there was so. one person who's happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We'll just let you, uh, well, she can give it to you, or you can take it later, whatever you want. Oh, you get to choose. No, she gets, oh, all, you, she gets all of that. Oh, gets all of them. Yeah. That's just the first. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's all one prize. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next is a weekend at Bear Creek Lodge in Eureka Springs. Ooh. Who loves me the most? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, I wonder if it's Bob Brooks. Is Bob Brooks here? All right. There he is. Congratulations. Okay, and then Becky, you got to help me out. What's the what's the uh, last one? Oh, that was it. I thought there was three. Oh, surprise! There was only there was only. <laughs> I was told there was three. All right. yeah, Dave is taking you to dinner. Uh, the third one. <laughs> You need these? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Now, next we're doing the check, right? Okay. So uh, this represents just the, Natalie, correct me if I'm wrong, this is just the ticket sales plus a uh, matching donation from Mach 1, correct? So our hope is that what you see on the check here is, is uh, just a fraction of what we will hopefully, Lord willing, raise tonight. I'm, I'm sure some of you put checks in the, the buckets as they went around. Uh, more importantly, I hope that as volunteers from FCA reach out to you, for those of you who said you're interested in, in working with FCA, I hope that you'll follow through on that commitment. You know, the Bible teaches us that, um, to put that where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. So, uh, and the Bible also teaches us that the, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. So, with that... Uh, Governor Huckabee, if you'll help me with one end of this, and we'll get a picture here with I get to make Coach Lunny. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh wow. David, you need to come around and get in the middle. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, Coach Lunny. Uh, I, it's, we're not done yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, this wasn't on your Mach uh, 1 plan, was it? So <laughs> this is uh, Step up here. This is, come here, David. Oh, okay. This is, um, this is a picture. Obviously, you can see it's a, it's a picture that uh, you may have seen on the video that was created years ago as an oil painting, and this comes from Kansas City for the support of David in Mach 1. And you can see number 18 with a long jersey on, right? And it's entitled Influence. And this is what athletes, the platform that we have. We're looking at a group of guys sitting in what they call a huddle group where they sit down after, after some type of activity at the camps and open the Bible and study scripture. And yet we have a young man looking at it. And this is a very highly... Prize, I, I remember when I got mine, but this is something we want to give to David Mach 1 because of the influence they've had. Thank you so much. For this. <clears throat> and thank you all so much for allowing us to be here and come in and hearing this. This has been great. I want to tell you, I didn't get it to because he keeps me on a time frame and I'll get chewed out tomorrow, but that's okay. I've been chewed out before. <clears throat> the money that, that comes to us, this is all missionary work. We'd receive no money whatsoever from a corporate office. Our, our people and our staff guys and ladies are here. Would they all stand up? I want uh, Drew Beard, T. Rake, and staff. Our, uh, Drew, stand up. He's our regional vice president. And T. Ray <laughs> is our state president. This is a, this is a, uh, it's a missionary work. And so the money that we're taking in tonight is going to, I'm sorry, there's Jeb. I'm sorry, Jeb. Where's, where's Becky? She ran out. 
Becky Patterson, Jamie, she here? Oh, that's in Becky. These are these are the ones that are going to the schools. They're doing the work, seeing the coaches, seeing the kids. We've got six counties that we have to serve with just so few people. We're in the process of trying to hire and bring new people on. And so what you've done here tonight and uh, giving us an opportunity is going to go a long way to bring additional staff on to get into these schools and junior schools, junior highs, middle schools, and the six counties that we're responsible for. So thank you so much for what you've done tonight, being here. Blessings to you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for supporting FCA. And uh, have a safe, safe trip home.